Hi, welcome to Resichem Tech. Today I'm going to cover how to make these sound reactive LED floor lamps that have all the features and more of the commercial version, and we're going to do it for less than half the cost. So hang around. So I saw commercial versions of these online, and here's an example of one of those. Now, there's nothing wrong with this product other than when I started looking at the price currently on sale for $144.50 down from a normal price of $170 and then I started looking at the feature set and I thought well there's a special sound reactive version of WLED out there and using some LED strips if I could figure out how to create a tube structure I could get all of these features and more including integration into Home Assistant which would cover the DIY and voice control modes and I figured I could do this for less than half of the price of these particular retail lamps. And if you're interested in something that is wall mountable as opposed to being a floor lamp, you may also be familiar with this product. Again, there's nothing wrong with it. We can use the same technique and take the aluminum uh, LED channel that I used in my motion activated stair lighting video, and we can use the same process and same effects to create a wall mounted pattern for sound reactive LED RGB lights. Okay, so here's the approach I'm going to take. Unlike most of my videos where I don't do any filming until I've completed a project, I'm going to film, film this one as I try to build it and talk about any kind of adjustments I have to make along the way. But I'm going to start out with using these 12-inch uh, um, pine planks. I'm going to mount my LEDs on this small uh, half-inch by quarter-inch uh, square uh, slats of wood. I actually have some of this left over from my uh, virtual window project. They serve as my crossbars, but the LEDs ought to, ought to fit on there nicely. And then for our tube, what I'm using, this is actually a uh, fluorescent tube protector. It slides over fluorescent tubes to prevent anyone getting hit with, with glass. Um, there are a couple of bucks, um, but the, the plan will be to mount this here and then I plan on designing a 3D printed part for the bottom down here to hold that. And this will slide over into the 3D printer part that will hold it in place. I'm also going to 3D print the cap for the top uh, that will help hold the, the piece of wood and also prevent light from coming out. But we definitely don't want a clear tube. Uh, we want some kind of diffuser or translucent on this so we get more of a pattern and we don't see all the individual LEDs. Now what I'm going to try, and I don't know if this is going to work, but it's some frosted glass spray paint. I've used this before on things like my uh, LED matrix clock, and it works pretty well on plexiglass. Don't know if it's going to work on this or not, and I've got to figure out how I'm going to try to spray paint this thing. First thing we're going to do is go out and get this thing painted, and we'll go from there. So while I fast forward through uh, a little bit of painting here, I just mentioned I used a uh, gray tinted a primer on this and then I think it was three coats of uh, flat black paint and a couple coats of polyurethane. In my case I was trying to match uh, my home theater equipment where this was going to go and I'd use this same technique on my DIY retro arcade machine and have been really happy with with how that finish turned out so I'm really just replicating that here. Of course you're free to paint this any color you want white or, or even leave it natural wood I did opt not to paint the bottom of this uh, just because it was going to be sitting on carpet and even though it would be thoroughly dry, I sure didn't want to risk getting any, anything on, on the carpet. Now for the clear tubes, I decided I was going to just lightly scuff up the surface with using a little bit of uh, 220 grit sandpaper. Again, this is very lightly. We don't want to actually gouge this. We just want to rough the surface up a little bit to give the paint something to stick to. I also uh, applied a little masking tape at the very top and bottom where these will be going into the 3D printed parts so you won't see that part there. But again, uh, don't squeeze too tight. Again, just a very light uh, rough of this and I found out that this actually technique actually worked much better than when I tried to paint it without. So here's a little jig I came up with to try to hold my tube in place while spray painting it. Uh, it's obviously just a piece of wood attached screwed to a base. It allows me to slide the tube over, clamp it to my workbench, and hold it in place. So at that point I started applying uh, various coats of spray paint. Uh, 
try to be as even as possible. Um, and at this point, really don't know how many coats of paint it's going to take. It's really going to be a little bit of trial and error. So this is after just two coats on our test piece, and it looks really promising. Um, if you look closely, you can see it's a little splotchy in parts. And so I'm going to guess that this is going to take uh, multiple coats. We'll, we'll keep applying to it, um, but it could be six, seven, eight coats or more to, to get the opacity and uh, try to eliminate some of the some of the splotchiness. So here you can see a picture of one of the final tubes. Now this one has the 3D cap on the top, but it turned out pretty well. I don't really remember how many coats of paint, seven, eight. I, I know I used three quarters or more of, a, of the can of spray paint. And here I'm uh, test printing that base part. Again, this was just designed in Tinkercad, which is a free online tool for doing basic shapes. I'm not real good at it, but I've mentioned this in other videos. Having a 3D printer available for things like this are invaluable, and the cost of them have come down so much. Uh, if you're going to do a lot of DIY tinkering, you almost have to have one of these in your arsenal. Okay, now we're going to take our, our wood strip, and what we want to do is place this down here in the position it's going to be, and we're going to make a pencil mark where the top of this is going to be, and then on the other end, we're going to take our end cap, put this onto here, and again, make another mark. And then we want to cut our WS2812 pixel strip to align up between those two marks. And when I measure this out, I come up with just about 67 uh, pixels. Uh, your results may vary, but we're going to use 67 pixels on this. So now that we've got that, we're going to go ahead and solder a JST connector on the end of this, and then we're going to install this onto our, our strip. Now I like to use these JST connectors so it makes it easy to disconnect and possibly even move your floor lamp somewhere um, without dragging the whole controller along with it, but they're totally optional. One thing to note though, um, I'm going to basically tin each of the three connectors here, but be careful which end of the strip that you're attaching to. You want to attach your JST connector to the data end, and that's indicated by a little arrow on the strip itself telling you which direction the data flows. Also note, I'm using WS2812B, which are just RGB strips here. If you really want the ability to have the warm white, which we saw in the retail version of that, you can sim simply substitute these uh, WS2812 strips with something like 5050 RGBW or SK6812 strips that have a true warm white pixel in addition to the RGB pixels. So now I'm going to use my technique of taking some of this 3M double-sided tape and I'm going to lay that down and then put the adhesive strip on top of that. I've just found that the adhesive on these strips doesn't hold long term and by using a little bit of this double-sided tape it's much less likely that your strips are going to come loose. So we're just going to run this down the middle. Now, a little at a time, we're going to peel off a little bit of the top side of this tape, and we're going to peel off a little backing on our strips, and we're going to carefully line up and apply strips to the tape. So be sure to press down firmly between each pixel, make sure we're getting good adhesion, and we'll just work our way down the strip. Okay, this is the part of the project I was the least uh, confident about, is, is the mounting of this. So I, I found the center position on my, on my base, centered this over, and went ahead and made marks for my, my tabs. Now I need to try to get this angle bracket in here and get this marked just in the right spot because we need to mount that first, then slide this over the top. So we're going to mark that position 
and try to drill a, uh, some screws in there and see how it goes. Now, for the big test, take our masking tape off of here and we're going to hope for the best. Yes, works, and, and I will admit, even without the top cap on, it is it is pretty stable. So I am very happy with with that. So for our controller, we're going to use the exact same components in the same assembly that I cover in building your own LED controller for under six dollars with WLED. Uh, there's going to be a, a couple of uh, additions here, but we're going to use a Wemos D1 Mini for our controller. This is going to be our logic level shifter. We're going to mount this on an electro cookie mini board, but the addition over that other video is we're going to add this microphone. This is a, an Adafruit Electec microphone, uh, Max 9814. And again, I will detail um, in the link of my blog article on the additional wiring, but we're really, we're going to wire our uh, BDD and our gain to our 3.3 volts on our Wemos D1 Mini, ground to ground, and our out is going to go to our AO, or our analog pin, uh, on our Wemos D1 Mini. Uh, the only other change is when we go to load WLED on to our Wemos D1 Mini, we're gonna select the sound reactive version. Now I'm not gonna cover building the actual LED controller here. Um, I have another video that will give you a step-by-step -step, uh, process of how to build that. Um, along with a blog article. Just note that the only difference between that video and this is the addition of that microphone and those three additional wires. Again, check the video description links down below and I'll have a link to a blog that will have this diagram. Also talks about how to load the sound reactive version of WLED onto your controller. And optionally, how to power two floor lamps off of a single controller. So there's one more thing I want to cover since I mentioned it at the beginning of this video. If you'd rather create wall mounted uh, sound reactive LEDs as opposed to a floor lamp, it's so again a little bit of this aluminum channel uh, which can be purchased online. I used it in my stair video and the advantage of this uh, again it comes with the diffuser is and mounting clips you can simply mount this on the wall and Unlike the commercial version, you're not limited to just a 90 degree. You could put these at any kind of angle that you want. Pretty much any length, you do have to be somewhat concerned about the, uh, the power supply. But, and also unlike the, uh, the retail version, 
you have the full suite of WLED beyond the sound reactive mode. So hundreds of effects, solid colors, fading, anything that WLED can do, you can do again with these strips and you can also make it sound reactive and react to music. So I wanted to mention that as another option as opposed to the floor lamps. So now that our build is complete, let's take a look at how we did with feature versus cost comparison over the commercial version. Now, I will freely admit I do not own nor have I officially reviewed the Govi Lyra version of this. So the information I provide here comes right off of their website as of the date of this recording. They list RGB ICWW. Now, I put a green check mark here. I opted to use the WS2812B LED strips, which do not have the separate warm white chip. But as I mentioned, you could easily substitute something like SK6812 uh, pixel strips in here and add that warm white pixel if that's what you really desire. They list a DIY mode. Well, obviously, WLED itself has all sorts of options for macros, for creating your own presets, for creating custom colors. Plus, we have the native integration into Home Assistant, which gives us the advantage of being able to create automations. So I say we, we get a check mark for DIY mode. Voice control, again, through our Home Assistant integration, we can control these lights with both Google Assistant and Amazon Echo. It lists a mobile app, and they actually do have an RF remote. Uh, WLED has a really nice uh, mobile app as well, and we're gonna add the control of Home Assistant. Now. If I'm sure someone out there uh, more talented than I could actually add an IR or an RF remote to these lights if, if that's what you really want. They list 25 lighting effects. WLED currently has over 100 lighting effects. They list six music modes. Currently the sound reactive version of uh, WLED has 15 music modes. So we've pretty much checked off all the boxes here. Let's see how we do on price. Currently, as a, again, as the day of this recording, they list the price for two of these at $260.10. That's $144.50 on sale, plus they'll give you a 10% discount for two. They do offer free shipping, but that would be, I would imagine, before tax. Our cost for creating two of our DIY versions, about $85. So again, there are plenty of reviews out there of the GoV version, and so I would encourage you to take a look at those. But it seems like my case, we've got a lot more features here for a little less than one third of the price. So that's gonna do it for this video. If you found anything in this video that you liked or you found useful, go ahead and hit that like button. That lets both me and YouTube know you'd like to see more videos like this. If you'd like to see more of my videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. And if you wanna be notified when I release new videos, click that little bell icon. As always, thanks for watching and we hope to see you soon.